Five. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this completely fantastic session as part of NACFC this year. Um, that's part of a psychosocial um, social work and, and psychosocial research track. And we'll have a psychosocial research showcase session for the next couple hours. And uh, I am uh, moderating um, along with Deborah Friedman, who you also see on the screen. And we really look forward to this set of abstracts. And first of all, I want to thank the committee, community for doing such stellar work in the midst of the chaos of COVID this past year. So this was a hard session to figure out what to offer as presentations because there were so many good abstracts submitted. And I hope that you will enjoy and be inspired by the set of abstracts that are about to go as much as Deborah and I have been. So in the next two hours, we'll get to learn from five different abstracts, and the topics are as follows. There will be one on fertility and fatherhood in men with CF, one on stress and mental health in CF one year after the COVID pandemic, an Italian sample, one on stress and quality of life in adults with CF with mild depression, another on early childhood behavioral health assessment for kids with CF ages four to 11, and the last one, sleep-related outcomes following participation in a behavioral sleep intervention for youth with CF. We will host uh, a few minutes of questions after each abstract, and um, we'll get started with the first abstract now. So the first is fertility and fatherhood in men with CF. And the um, first author and presenter of this talk will be Christine O'Keefe, who's in her final year of medical school at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and is kind enough to be part of this panel, even though it's nighttime for her. Thanks. So hello, everyone. My name is Christine O'Keefe, and I'm happy to present this uh, presentation in the workshop today on behalf of the Toronto uh, CF care team. So our study was called Fertility and Fatherhood in Men with Cystic Fibrosis. As I mentioned, my name is Christine, but the other authors were Arbana Alongo, Catherine Griffin, Jenna Sykes, and Dr. Elizabeth Tullis. So as the presenter, I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So as we can see, there's been a wonderful increase in life expectancy of men with cystic fibrosis over the past few decades. And this is um, a testament really to all of the great work that's being done on the care side and also on the research side. And what this also means is that the priorities for CF care can now expand to not just merely focus on increasing longevity and dealing with the respiratory complications of CF, but to also include the other different areas that CF affects the body. And one of those in particular is fertility. So as we know, 98% uh, of men with CF are infertile. And the reason for this is that they have something called congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. So as you can see on the picture, that's a um, anatomy image of the male genital tract. So you can see the testes, the epididymis, the vas deferens, and the seminal vesicles. And the pathophysiology, I believe, is still not entirely known. And what they think happens is that the vas deferens very early on in life becomes clogged with secretions and it uh, degenerates. So what the men are left with is testes that function normally, seminal vesicles that function normally, but no way of connecting the two. So men are infertile, they have azoospermia. However, they are able to father their own children biologically if they use artificial reproductive technologies. And currently up until this point, there really hasn't been very many long-term studies or very large scale studies looking at fertility outcomes in men with CF. I think the largest ones were done in 2005 and they're mostly done in an Australian cohort. So we sort of wanted to update this knowledge base. So our objective was to better understand the knowledge, attitudes, and decisions of men with CF regarding reproductive potential and fatherhood. So we designed a qualitative cross-sectional study that was given or allowed to be given to all male CF patients followed at the Toronto CF clinic, but they have to be current patients, obviously. So it was available online from October, 2020 to January, 2021 and 193 men were invited and 106 responded. 
So our survey design was sort of broken down into three key areas. So the first was demographics. So we looked at the age, what CFTR mutation they had, what how old they were when they got their diagnosis and their current lung function. Then the second part was the knowledge and beliefs about CF's effects on fertility. So we asked about, um, did they know their own fertility status? At what point did they become aware of the effects of CF on fertility in general for men? Any emotions they felt when they found that and what resources they utilized and would have liked to have had access to. And then the last bit was experiences in starting a family. So we grouped, we asked them if they currently were fathers, if they were planning on becoming fathers, or if they did not have an interest in becoming a father. And we then looked at how they became a father if they did, and the factors affecting their decision making either way. So to go to the results of the study, so our part one demographics. So the median age at the time the survey was completed was 37 years, and that ranged from 18 to 74. Majority were in a relationship, either married or uh, just in partnership, and the majority were employed. And then there's just some further characteristics in table one over here. So you can see that the uh, major mutation that they had, not surprisingly, was the Delta F508. Majority of patients did not currently have a diagnosis of CF-related diabetes, and their CF appeared to be fairly well controlled in that the majority either had zero or one chest infections in the past 12 months, and their predicted FEV1% went well, sort of ranged um, from the 80 to 100s down to the 40 to 59%. In the second part, we looked at the knowledge of fertility. So this was what age did you become aware that CF affects fertility in men? So that's what the uh, graph on the left is looking at. So we asked them, at what age did you become aware of this? And then we asked them, at what age would you have wanted this discussion to happen? And what age would you have wanted to know about this? So you can see that the majority of men found out about these issues around the ages of 16 to 19. However, when asked, the majority would said that they would have wanted to have known prior to the age of 16. And that's significant because at that age, they are still under the care of the pediatric CF team. Whereas at the 16 to 19, they've now started to or are in the adult CF care clinic. And then the graph on the right is the initial source of information that um, kind of gave them the, that they used to find out about these fertility issues. So the, major, the main one mentioned was health-related literature, um, parent or guardian, and then pediatric CF care team. Okay, so then we then asked them, all right, you know about the issues, you found out about the issues or the impact of CF on fertility by age, and now how did that make you feel? So we gave them a list of all of these emotions and it's a little bit hard because we had to ask them to think back to when they learned it. And so for some of these men, that was thinking back uh, 20 plus years. But what we found is the men who found out before the age of 16, the pretty much majority of them said that they just felt indifference. It didn't really bother them one way or the other. Whereas the older they got, the more you started to see a mix of emotions and in particular sadness. You can see in the 16 to 19, it's kind of a split between indifference and sadness. And then the 20 to 24, you have some confusion and um, stress. And then in the greater than 25, sadness was the main emotion. And this can kind of track with the fact that in the 25 plus, it is very possible that a lot of those, uh, some of those men were actually diagnosed with CF because they weren't able to have a, a child with their partner when they came in and then they did the testing and found that not only are they infertile, but they have CF. So that might explain a bit of uh, why there's more sadness in an older age group. And then this is, uh, we gave some blank text boxes to ask the men to kind of describe in their own words, the emotions that they felt. And we did a very basic kind of uh, thematic analysis and we just identified some um, things that kept popping up. So there was kind of five themes that we kept seeing. So the bit, first one was acceptance. So a lot of them saying, oh, I just ended up making my peace with it. Um, the next one was sort of this idea of kind of a lack of knowledge when they first found out and a bit of frustration of that fact. 
So one of them said, I feel like I learn only, I feel like I learn more about the disease only when it becomes relevant. Another issue, that, another thing that came up a lot with sex. So um, one representative quote was, it allowed me to have carefree relationships with many people. So for some men, um, learning about this actually was perhaps freeing in some way. Then this idea of kind of transformation of knowledge in that, you know, men kind of initially becoming upset, but then by gaining more information and learning about the different ways of becoming fathers, their attitudes about it changing. So this person said, the more I learned about fertility, the more I realized I'm still able to have children. And then another key area that came up was stress in relationships. So someone mentioned going through IF has been very difficult on my wife. And there's been added stress on me knowing that it was my issue that forced her to go through the added struggles. So it's just kind of nice to kind of hear in their own words how this knowledge impacted them. And then the last part, we looked at fatherhood. So we had broken them into three groups. So the men that were currently fathers, the ones that were planning on becoming fathers, and then the ones that were not planning on becoming fathers. And so the ones that were planning on becoming a father, sorry, the ones that were a father, when we asked them the method that they used to become fathers, the majority had mentioned that they used ART. So artificial reproductive techniques using a sperm and IVF. And then the next highest one was um, being a, becoming a stepfather to a partner's child. We then looked at what resources they would have wanted to have consulted when they were making the decision about how to become a father. And it looked like the main one they mentioned was discussions with CF care team, online resources, and written resources as clinics. So it's just kind of showing that, you know, there's a lot of trust in the CF care team and they kind of want to be that first point of contact for patients. Then we looked at the men who currently were uh, fathers and then the ones who did not want to become fathers. And we asked them to list the key factors that kind of influence their decision to become fathers or not to become fathers. So the ones that were current fathers, the main factor that they mentioned was a desire to have a child that shares my DNA, then cost associated with fertility treatment, and then concern about passing on my CF mutation to any biological children. And then when we look at the men who did not plan to become a father, the main factor that influenced their decision was just with a lack of interest, not wanting to be a father anyways, and then concern about how living with CF will affect my parenting ability. So our, we had three key takeaways from this study. The first is that most men prefer to learn about fertility at an earlier age than what is currently occurring. And we saw that we have seen that in prior research. The second bit was that the emotions men felt upon learning about fertility outcomes varies according to age. So the younger groups, it's more kind of indifference. And then the older you are, the more you see these negative emotions popping up. And the last bit was that the desire to father biological children seems to be a strong factor in the decision to be, become a parent. In that the main method still of becoming a father in men with CF is um, ART. And then the main factor that was identified is a desire to have a child with my biological DNA. So this was a um, fairly quick study, but I think it gave us a good kind of snapshot of how the men in our practice are kind of understanding and viewing their fertility. So then going forward, we can come up with some questions. So how can barriers to family planning sort of be better addressed? How can discussions around fertility in CF be tailored to best suit patients' needs? And then this study was actually completed before uh, Trikapta and the other effective modulators really kind of took a hold in the Canadian market. So it would be very interesting to kind of repeat this study uh, a few years down the line and to see if the impact on those drugs on longevity is impacting men with CF's views of fatherhood. So those are our references, and thank you so much for your attention. Live. What a great abstract, and thank you so much, Dr. O'Keefe, for sharing such a good talk. There are a series of questions, and I look forward to hearing your responses. And I believe that there, um, there is at least one other co-author, Dr. Yango, who's also present and um, glad to um, to. Uh, offer thoughts as well, although not officially in the context of this session. 
Um, so Dr. O'Keefe, uh, one question from the um, audience is, 55% response rate is great. What methods did you use to obtain that large of a response rate? So I think Dr. Alango can probably actually give a better answer than me for that one because she was responsible for getting that great response rate. But basically what we did is we kind of just took the database we already had and we sent out an email uh, asking them if they'd be willing to complete the survey. And then there was a follow-up email sent kind of a few weeks later. And I think the response rate kind of just speaks to the fact that this is an important issue for men in CF and they were like really willing and happy to kind of give us their thoughts and feedback so that we can kind of help them uh, going forward. Great. Did any participants comment on the impact of the knowledge of infertility on the perception of their masculinity? No, that's a really good question. Um, when we put the free text boxes into the survey, we didn't give them quite a lot of room to type too much. So a lot of the uh, quotations are very kind of short and snappy. Um, so it would be really interesting actually to kind of as a follow-up, maybe do interviews with some of these patients and kind of explore this a little bit deeper. But yeah, that didn't come up in our survey. That's great. Um, do you have any recommendations for pediatric CF teams about addressing this topic with patients? Um, so I guess kind of how I'm, because I'm, as you mentioned, a final year medical student. So kind of how we're learning to broach topics about fertility and screening and whatnot in a GP context is to just kind of ask everyone these questions. And so I think maybe in the pediatric clinic, it would be more around the fact that, okay, so you might be aware that men with CF have decreased fertility, and that doesn't mean though that you shouldn't not be using protection when you are engaging in sexual contacts and kind of starting off the conversation there. Because um, as it was shown in our survey, generally like the younger uh, group isn't as worried about their potential for fatherhood. But a lot of them did make uh, comments to the fact that like, oh, great, I don't have to wear condoms now. And, you know, so that might be a good place to kind of just start the conversation and get it into their minds that, yes, fertility is going to be an issue. But at this stage, please still practice safe sex. And then we kind of like almost normalize it because everyone's getting that kind of message at that age. What are some ways to, um, what, to address barriers to family planning? Hmm. That is a good one. Um, I would say, I suppose having kind of conversations with the patients about sort of what they need at the various stage points in their life. I know a lot of the patients did mention the very high cost of artificial reproductive technologies. And I think, you know, it would be great if that could be covered somehow under OHIP, but like, that'd be great. Uh, or if it would be a little easier to get under insurance plans and whatnot. But yeah, I feel like that would be more of a, kind of, what's the word, <laughs> larger scale uh, intervention as opposed to kind of stuff we can, I mean, we can always try to push for it as CF care doctors and kind of really promote the fact that, you know, a lot of men with CF they want to have their own biological children. This is how they're going about doing it, but this is a barrier. So kind of advocating for our patients in that way. Well, and I mean, I think that's one of the really interesting things about your study is that you raise such important topics that could be addressed one-on-one -on -one with individual patients, could be addressed to develop clinic uh, flows and, and clinic education practices on both the pediatric and adult side. And then there may be some even sort of systems wide implications in terms of access to family planning um, or access to um, adoption, right? So I, I think you, you raise so many potential avenues. And this question came up from the audience and it was one in my mind as well, though. I'm really curious about your thoughts about educational tailoring to meet patients' needs. And if you have, um, or if, you're, if your study showed uh, themes in terms of approaches that patients would appreciate or timing that patients would appreciate? Um, so when we asked most of the patients about how they initially got their information, a lot of it was still via online and kind of stuff that they had heard from um, other CF patients or even in some cases their parents because their parents would have known about this and they could have passed it on to them. 
One thing that did come up as like a support that some men wanted was this idea of kind of uh, support groups and kind of sort of, again, normalizing it within the CF community as, you know, 98% of men have uh, CBAVD. So while yes, it's, you know, not what the general population experiences, I think kind of bringing it into that context and letting them kind of speak and talk about it and then kind of always just checking in with them, I would say, because it is a lot of information to get, obviously, but there was a clear theme um, that some of the men were saying, and I think I mentioned this in the talk about, oh, like, what else don't I know about my CF, Mm. Um, right? And like, that's understandable, because obviously there's a lot of things that are associated with CF that people have to work on. Um, But yeah, I would just say, kind of bringing it more into like the community kind of shine like you're not alone in this. So, so integrating some peer mentorship to reduce the feeling of isolation. And then also sort of, it sounds like earlier on normalizing discussion about this, because for folks that found out later, it almost felt like a violation of trust or a betrayal to not know. So that, that relates to another question that came up. And this may need to be our last question in terms of time. For males that reported learning about infertility later, was there any evidence that these were folks that were also diagnosed later? Yeah, um, so I believe those individuals were the ones who had actually tried to have children and then they couldn't, and then they kind of came in and then found out that, oh, you know, I can't have children and I have CF. So I think that actually was quite a lot, that was a large portion of that group. And that sort of also explains why their primary emotion was sadness mm. because their reason almost kind of for coming in was that they wanted to have children and they couldn't. And then they also got this diagnosis on top of that. Got it. So that was a, um, that was a connection that the audience heard in your abstract as well. Well, Dr. O'Keefe, thank you so much for your work and for offering this abstract for our, t- our session. And I hope you enjoy the rest of NACFC. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, if that's okay by you. Um, and thank you very much. Bye. Bye. So next is Sonia Graziano, who is a clinical psychologist and research fellow at the Bambino Gesù. Oh, I'm murdering that pronunciation, Sonia. I'm sorry. Children's Hospital in Rome and the CF unit. Her main interest is on trauma and stress. She's a member of the ECFS Mental Health Research Working Group and a member of the U.S. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Mental Health Committee. And um, her group did just a wonderful study looking at stress and mental health in CF one year after the COVID pandemic, findings from an Italian sample. Thanks. Welcome everybody, I'm Sonia Graziano, I'm a clinical psychologist and I work at the Division of Cystic Fibrosis of the Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital in Rome. First, I want to thank you, Dr. Deborah Friedman, for inviting me to present at this workshop. It is a great pleasure for me to be part of this event. I will be speaking today about the results of the study, Stress and Mental Health in Cystic Fibrosis, one year after the COVID pandemic. This study was developed one year after we had a complete lockdown of Italy with the main goal of evaluating the impact of stress linked with the COVID-19 pandemic in people with CF. I worked on this project with my colleagues at the Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital in Rome. There are no conflicts of interest to disclose related to this presentation. The rapid and unpredictable spread of COVID-19 was associated with increased stress and new mental health concerns for people with CF who are already at increased risk for depression and anxiety. The COVID-19 pandemic quickly and profoundly changed people's lives, disrupting daily routines, behaviors and habits. The impact of restrictive measures adopted in many countries to contain the outbreak had psychological and psychosocial implications. Fear of the disease became a common feeling. Fear, anxiety was related to being infected, infecting others, and concerns about its associated comorbidities and high mortality rates. 
loss of normal routines, social isolation, and severe economic recession contributed to increasing stress and worsening mental health. Psychological distress and mood disorders during the COVID-19 pandemic were documented increased stress, depression, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, anger, and occasionally adjustment disorder and post-traumatic stress disorders. In response to this pandemic, several studies have been conducted to evaluate its impact on people with CF. A study conducted by Habermas et al. highlighted psychological concerns reported in adults with CF. The top-ranked concerns were afraid of being infected by the virus, extra alert for dangerous situation, and I cannot adhere to my usual routines. Anxiety and fear were the predominant psychological issues. Increased stress, negative thoughts, and trouble sleeping were frequently reported. People with CF reported disruption in their daily routines, but they also reported spending more time on nebulizer treatment and airway clearance. The primary goal of the study was to assess stressful events and mental health in adolescents, young adults with CF over time, about one year after the COVID pandemic began in February 2020 in Italy. This was a cross-sectional study documenting the effects of the pandemic on people with CF after 10 to 12 months. We recruited 66 consecutive people with CF in stable clinical conditions, ages 14 to 39 years. 18% of the sample, 12 people, have been affected by asymptomatic COVID-19. Average lung function was 80% and average BMI was 21. All participants completed the following psychological screening tools, the PHQ-9 for depression, the GAT-7 for anxiety, and the COVID exposure and family impact scale, adolescents and young adults, SAFIS AIA. Health outcome data were also collected as FEV1 and BMI. People with CF who had other chronic diseases were excluded as well as those infected by COVID-19 within two months of the assessment. The first two measures are well known and are part of the annual screening process recommended by the mental health guidelines developed in 2015. Respondents also completed the CEFIS EIA a 44-item measure which asked participants to reflect on experience since March 2020 to the present. This third measure was developed in May 2020 by Dr. Anne Kezak and her colleagues using a rapid iterative process and was designed to estimate the impact of the pandemic. At the time, the COVID pandemic was impacting most if not all families to some extent. Communities were under stay-at-home orders, schools were closing, and health and financial implications of the COVID pandemic were emerging. It measures exposure to potentially traumatic aspects of COVID-19 and assesses the impact of the pandemic on the individual and the family. CEFIS AIA was translated by my study group utilizing the FDA and EMA guidelines. Two native Italian speakers translated the CEFIS AIA from English into Italian. A discussion with Dr. N. Kezat was conducted to discuss and resolve discrepancies to produce the consensus forward Italian version, focusing on cultural equivalence and specific terms. The consensus measure was then back translated into English by an Italian speaker with strong English skills, followed by a discussion with the author to ensure the instruction, items, and rating scales conveyed the original meaning 
This was called harmonization. Surface area is available for use without charge through the Center for Pediatric Traumatic Stress. The measure is now available in English, Spanish, and Italian. The measure has three scale. Part one, exposure, consists of 28 items with yes, no responses that measure the participant exposure to COVID-19 related and related events. Part two, impact, consists of 16 items that measure the impact of COVID-19. Items assesses perception on, on how pandemic-related events affect daily functioning and emotional distress. Items are rated on a four-point Likert scale. One item uses a 10-point distress scale. Scores denote more negative, higher scores denote more negative impact or higher distress. Part three is an open-ended question about the, the other effects of COVID-19 on the individual and family members, both positive and negative. The exposure score is calculated by totaling the number of yes responses across 28 items that tap disruptions in day-to-day -day life, such as experience to stay at home orders, school close, closure, caring for family member, difficulty assessing resources such as food, medication, cleaning supplies, financial stressors, and family exposure to COVID-19, such as having symptoms being hospitalized. Examples of items in part one are I, we have difficulty getting medicine, I, we self-quarantined to do to, to, uh, to travel for possible exposure, someone in the family was exposed to someone with COVID-19, my, our income decreased. Part two assesses the impact of COVID-19 on the participant and family life via 16 items across numerous domains, including getting along with caring for family members, being independent and social health and well-being. Part two asks the following question. COVID-19 may have many impacts on you and your family life. In general, how was Oh, sorry, how has uh, the COVID pandemic affected each of the following examples included the ability to care for your health, your physical well-being, for example, sedentary behavior, exercise, physical activity, sleeping, your emotional well-being, loneliness. One item measuring overall distress rating is rated on a 10-point scale. The impact score is computed by summing rating across the 16 items with higher scores reflecting greater impact. Results. Before COVID-19 emerged, I performed a mental health screening study of the entire CF Center, and I have illustrated these results in the blue bars, which are pre-COVID rates of depression and anxiety above the clinical cutoff. The yellow bars indicate these scores approximately one year later. Surprisingly, rates of depression and anxiety decreased one year later in comparison to the pre-COVID rates. Still, a high percentage of participants scored in the clinical elevated range, mild to severe. On depression, 31% and anxiety, 29%. It is notable that a very low proportion reported moderate to severe symptomatologies, symptomatology in the yellow bars, only 5% and 8% respectively. The percentage was lower for both depression and anxiety in comparison to rates detected one year before COVID-19. Participants reported a variety of COVID-19 related events, including stay-at-home order, school closures, 
missed or cancelled family events, and a surprising number, 35%, had a family member with COVID. The mean exposure score in our sample was 5.2 out of 28, suggesting that after one year, exposure to this event was not frequent. Less frequently endorsed item on CEFIS uh, area included in the, on the exposure scale, I had to move, had difficulty getting health care, difficulty getting medicine, I lost my job permanently, someone in the family was hospitalized or died from COVID-19. Four participants had a family member hospitalized for COVID-19, two had a family member in the ACU, and two lost a family member for COVID-19. The mean, the mean impact score was 1.8, indicating that currently the pandemic was not having, having a significant impact on people with CF daily lives. However, two items related to sedentary activity and exercise were elevated, suggesting that the pandemic had a substantial effect on these activities. The average distress rating was 5.9 out of 10, indicating moderate levels of distress. No significant differences were found between those who did versus did not have an asymptomatic COVID-19 infection. So, now to the discussion. Approximately one year after the onset of the pandemic, people with CF were doing surprisingly well. Despite expectation that this group was particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, their depression and anxiety scores were substantially lower than those obtained pre-COVID. Although their exposure and impact scores were not ele elevated, being sedentary, and missing exercise were negatively affected and are a critical part of the disease management. Overall, these results suggested that people with CF are highly resilient and nearly one year after the onset of COVID-19, they have re-established stable emotional health and daily activities. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Dr. Graziano, thank you so much for this just incredibly nuanced study. A, a year into COVID, we thought we'd be done by then, right? And, and here we are lingering on. So it still feels in, like incredibly timely work. And one of the things that I loved the most about this abstract in this study is how strength-based it was and how much it highlighted the resiliency of our community. Uh, as no surprise, there are a number of questions coming through. And I guess uh, related to that sort of background that I, that I offered, um, the first question is, do you have any thoughts on why severe or moderate depression and anxiety rates seemed lower post-COVID? Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this question. Um, people with, I think people with CF uh, are used to infection control, uh, like wearing masks and uh, isolating from those who are currently ill. And uh, this pandemic at the beginning was so scary for uh, people with CF, but over time we had the possibility to um, have more information. And particularly we uh, understood that people with CF were less vulnerable that we thought at the, the beginning. So I think uh, um, we can say with this data that uh, they are well prepared and uh, uh, to handle uh, a global uh, pandemic and probably the stress they felt uh, at the beginning uh, because just uh, when we had the complete lockdown uh, in my country, they were very scary, super scary. And um, but over time, uh, they they felt they they have a lot of uh, coping skills and uh, to cope with the, the pandemic. Uh, yeah. 
That's a, a lovely answer. And I'm and I'm wondering what your thoughts are if you were to do the study again now, so close to two years into the pandemic, would you get different answers, do you think? Or do you think it would be the same or even better? Um, you know, I think it uh, will be completely different uh, because we have a big uh, new variable, which is trikafta. Uh, because at the time of the study, uh, this um, drug was not approved in Italy, was not distributed in Italy. And, uh, but now we have a lot of patients under trikafta. And uh, probably if we, uh, we, we do the same assessment, we will have a, a complete different uh, uh, results in terms of time, of course. But uh, I think this variable of trikafta will be, uh, will, will be um, let us see a very different uh, data. Understood. And and I think that's related to another question here, which is that the average FEV1 in the study sample was fairly high. Do you, do you think that might have had an impact on the study findings? I mean, this may be a little bit connected with what, with what you just described, that with trifacta, tri, excuse me, with trikafta available now, perhaps people's coping would be even, um, you know, more study. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, we didn't perform um, a specific correlation with uh, FEV1 because the, um, the, the value of the FEV1 was very similar uh, in the sample we had uh, pre-COVID. So uh, this, is, uh, this average is uh, the usual average in our uh, center. And um, so we didn't thought this uh, was uh, very uh, linked with the COVID-19 response in terms of stress. But uh, maybe we can go deeply and understand if we, have, we found something. Yeah, your, your sample size was so nice and big. I don't know whether you've then been, a, been able to stratify some of the results a little more. I didn't know whether you noticed patterns by age, for example, or perhaps by status in terms of being in school or being in the workforce. Yes, uh, of course, so we, the, uh, the plan now is to go deeply in the results. Uh, and write uh, a paper on uh, this, um, this study. And of course, we, we will need to stratify the sample based on age and uh, also uh, sex, of course. We don't have a lot, a lot of uh, patients in uh, this sample, but 66 uh, can be a good uh, number to uh, perform other uh, specific analysis. Nice. Were, uh, an audience member wonders if you were surprised by the results. Uh, yes, a little bit, but it was a nice surprise. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go looking for problems, you find strengths instead, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. That's a nice problem. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. It is also because we're at the beginning, um, also the provider uh, were afraid uh, uh, in terms of the impact uh, of uh, COVID-19 in uh, our uh, population. So we felt better when we found uh, uh, that uh, uh, our population is not uh, a very high, high risk as we thought at uh, the beginning. And this was also in terms of mental health. So I think it's, yeah, it's a good surprise. <laughs> That's a lovely surprise. Uh, someone is asking if you checked uh, for differences in the in the data at the pre-COVID or baseline time point between those who had post-COVID data and those who did not. So were you able to control that way? Yes, we checked, but uh, in our sample, we, we didn't find uh, any differences, uh, but probably uh, because the sample was small, because uh, we had just 12 patients uh, who had the COVID in this uh, sample, and uh, all of them were asymptomatic. 
none of them had to go to the hospital or uh, was in a difficulty uh, condition, medical condition. Nice. And, and I don't know, Dr. Graziano, if you work with patients that are also not CF or if all of your job is folks with CF, but someone was wondering about what a control group might have looked like and if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, do you think a control group would have had different mental health findings? Um, this can be a new study. <laughs> Right. And uh, uh, yes, I work also with other chronic condition. Uh, I think uh, uh, can be uh, it will be different. My expectation uh, is that uh, it will be different uh, with uh, chronic disease, but not respiratory respiratory disease, because uh, in this case, uh, people were very prepared to control the infection. So maybe. It, it, I think it's a very good idea, um, but if I have to think uh, in terms of other um, con control of another one, another control group, I think uh, uh, about uh, no no respiratory disease. Got it. Um, what do you think might be? And this, I think, has to be our last question. Um, what do you think might be some of the protective factors for people with CF that help them to cope? I know that you've mentioned already that folks with CF are accustomed to infection control practices. I guess the other that occurs to just me as the moderator is that coping with some unpredictability is a skill a lot of people with chronic disease learn you know, early in their disease adjustment process. But are there other protective uh, factors that you think uh, helped your popul population ad uh, adapt to COVID life? Um, maybe. Uh they had this uh, resiliency also because they had to cope they have to start to learn how to cope with the stress very early in their life yeah and so because they are under a uh, chronic stress in a chronic condition so probably they used to build uh, uh, in our population, they used to build uh, the, their skills, their own skills uh, over time. Uh, so this is probably why they were not shocked. Just at the beginning, they were shocked, of course, because uh, it was like, uh, oh, my God, this is uh, very dangerous because I have a chronic disease. And now it's uh, they had a lot of catastrophic thinking at the beginning. Uh, but in terms of... Um, what we can uh, call also like a post-traumatic growth. I think uh, uh, during uh, their experience with CF, uh, they build uh, re uh, coping skills over time. Uh, and they have like a toolkit with them, I think. Lovely. And I don't know if this was a factor in your families. In the United States, there has certainly been conflict uh, within families about what the proper COVID precautions should be. And I think for families with um, a family member who has CF, there has been less conflict around that. There's been better family unity and solidarity around caution. And, and I don't know if you observed that in your setting or whether there is more unity and solidarity in, in the Italian population in general around COVID precautions. Yeah, probably, probably yeah. you are right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, uh, um, our culture is based on family and relationship uh, in the family. And usually uh, we have a very strong uh, uh, connection to each other. And uh, sometimes this is a barrier because uh, the Italians are not that um, about the fact they used to go out uh, from the house where, when they are very old. But I think it's also a protective <laughs> factor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Sonia, thank you so much for your work and for this presentation. I'm so appreciative. I think that we are out of time. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Uh, but thank you so much for your work and thank for your you. talk. You bet. Thank you very much. Thank yes. You. Uh, next up is a, uh, an abstract on the perceived stress and, and quality of life in adults with CF 
with mild depression and anxiety. Um, and the, the presenter is well known in our CF community. Dr. Anna Georgia Papalis is a consulting psychiatrist for the Pediatric and Adult Cystic Fibrosis Programs at Massachusetts General in Boston. I'm Anna Georgiopoulos, the liaison psychiatrist for the Pediatric and Adult Cystic Fibrosis Programs at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak at the Psychosocial Research Showcase today. On behalf of the CFCBT study team, including co-PI Deborah Friedman, I'll be presenting some baseline data on our cohort today reporting on perceived stress and quality of life in adults with CF with mild depression and anxiety. These are my disclosures. The landmark TIDE study screened over 6,000 people with CF across nine countries for depression and anxiety. The study found elevated symptoms at two to three times more frequently than expected in the community, with rates increasing from adolescence into adulthood. There's also accumulating evidence of the impact of depression on people with CF, including decreased quality of life, difficulty sustaining daily care, increased health care costs, and poor health outcomes, including decreased survival. Mike Schechter and his colleagues analyzed data on over 1,000 individuals with CF who had been screened during the TIDE study. Here you see the Kaplan-Meier curve demonstrating that one elevated screening score for depression was associated with a doubling of mortality five years later. In response, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and European CF Society created the first CF mental health guidelines. These international guidelines recommend screening people with CF for depression and anxiety annually, starting at age 12. Those with mild symptoms are offered preventive education and support and rescreened in three months. Despite the potential for symptoms to persist and progress in severity, this at-risk group has been minimally studied. To address the need for evidence-based secondary prevention integrated into guidelines-based CF care, and with input from adults with CF and CF care teams, our team developed CFCBT, a cognitive behavioral skills-based program to promote well-being in adults with CF. CFCBT is based in cognitive therapy, which is a form of therapy that's brief, goal-oriented, skills-focused, and evidence-based, targeting emotions by changing thoughts and behaviors. The program is a CF-specific preventive intervention targeting adults with mild symptoms of depression and anxiety. An eight-session interventionist manual and participant workbook cover key topics and skills for living with CF, including relaxation, depression in CF, adaptive thinking, health-related goals, and anxiety in CF. The model is integrated into CF care, delivered by trained and supervised members of the multidisciplinary team including mental health professionals such as psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers, but also others such as nurses and pulmonologists. To reduce barriers to access, it can be delivered in person or virtually on an outpatient or inpatient basis. Our team is currently conducting a multi-center randomized waitlist controlled trial of CFCBT funded by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Adults with CF who score in the mild range for depression with the PHQ-9 or for anxiety with the GAD-7 are eligible to enroll. Those who are currently engaged in formal CBT are excluded, but to replicate real world conditions, other forms of mental health treatment are permitted. The study has closed to enrollment, and today I'd like to present some of our baseline participant data. This analysis aimed to characterize a sample of adults with CF engaged in a mental health intervention with mild depression or anxiety symptoms, and to examine differences in perceived stress and health-related quality of life by sociodemographic variables and disease severity. The sample included all individuals with CF, adults with CF, with mild PHQ-9 or GAD-7 that were enrolled in the CF-CBT randomized trial, covering the period from September 2019 to March 2021. Before randomization to waitlist or immediate CF-CBT intervention, all participants completed baseline questionnaires. Demographics and psychiatric medical history were completed by self-report and chart review. And participants also completed a perceived stress scale and cystic fibrosis questionnaire revised as a measure of health-related quality of life. Advanced disease was defined as uh, FEV1% predicted, predicted of less than 40%, home oxygen use, or someone who's been referred for or is post-transplant. We use descriptive statistics to characterize the sample and ANOVA to stratify CFQR and perceived stress scale data 
by age, gender, income, and disease severity. Given the homogeneity of the sample, we were unable to stratify by race and ethnicity. Participants range in age from 19 to 63 years, 65% self-identified as female, 3% identified as, as Hispanic or Latino, and 97% as white. Our sample was highly educated and most worked at least part-time. The FEV1 percent predicted ranged from 16 to 124. 20% met criteria for advanced disease, and five of the 60 participants were post-transplant. Most reported previous mental health treatment, but no experience with CBT. 80% had received psychotherapy prior to enrollment, with 40% participating in therapy currently. However, 67% had never had CBT, with an additional 15% unsure about what kind of therapy they'd accessed in the past. Only 25% had never taken medication for depression or anxiety, indicating that for many, their mild PH29 or GAD7 scores could reflect a partial remission from a previous moderate or severe episode of depression or anxiety rather than a first episode. The mean perceived stress scale score was elevated in comparison to published normative data in the general population for both men and women. There were no differences in perceived stress by any of our sociodemographic variables or by disease severity. Similarly, here we show quality of life on the 12 subscales of the CFQR for our CFCBT participants in orange and a large representative national sample of people with CF in blue for the CFQR. We see that 10 of the 12 subscale scores indicated lower quality of life um, for the participants in our study. The exceptions were respiratory symptoms and weight subscales, which this may reflect better health in the era of highly effective modulator therapy. There were no differences in any CFQR subscales by age or by income. However, treatment burden was significantly higher, meaning less perceived burden in those with advanced disease. There were no other differences by disease severity. Males reported lower health-related quality of life in the weight subscale, but there were no other differences by sex. In conclusion, the adults with CF with mild depression and anxiety symptoms that were enrolled in the CF-CBT randomized trial were diverse in age and disease severity, but homogeneous in race and ethnicity. Of note, 38% of those who were potentially eligible and approached by their teams declined to participate, although once people were enrolled, the dropout rate was very low. This highlights an opportunity to improve equitable provision of accessible mental health interventions. Despite endorsing only mild symptoms of depression or anxiety, participants reported heightened stress and poor health-related quality of life in some domains. These findings indicate that monitoring, psychoeducation, and support may not be sufficient for adults with CF with mild depression or anxiety, suggesting the potential value of interventions such as CFCBT that are aimed at secondary prevention. So where do we go from here? We'll look forward to analyzing outcomes from this adult randomized trial, including a six-month follow-up phase. At the same time, we're piloting an adapted CFCBT intervention for adolescents and an e-health adaptation in Dutch in preparation for future work in these areas. Of note, we plan to offer our one-day CFCBT interventionist training in 2022 in a format which will be available to members of any CF care team, so stay tuned for more details. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to thank the CFCBT site PIs, interventionists, and statisticians, as well as the CF Foundation, Dutch CF Society, Vertex, and Officium, and many colleagues which have supported these projects. Most importantly, I'd like to thank the many members of the CF community who have contributed to this work, and most importantly, express our gratitude to and admiration for our study participants. Thank you so much for a, a abstract that has so much data packed into a short amount of time and really has some lovely nuanced things to think about and opportunities for us to improve care in the CF Center. There's there's a variety of different questions I can pose to you, Dr. Dor Georgiopoulos, so we'll just sort of go uh, with a few. I mean, one question I've got is if you can talk a little bit about ways that the CF community's input was integrated into the development of the RCT, of the, um, the CBT program. 
Yes, so that was a really important part of um, of developing our program. We did qualitative interviews, semi-structured interviews with adults with CF for this um, adult version of the manual, and now for, with adolescents with CF and their parents for the adolescent version um, to really understand what are the ways that uh, what are the needs and what are the ways that cognitive behavioral therapy might need to be adapted for people with CF. Well, and related to that, then. It- in what ways is the CF CBT tailored to be CF specific or, or is it? It is tailored to be CF specific. And of course, CBT has um, a huge evidence base for uh, effectiveness for depression and anxiety, both for treatment and for prevention. However, um, we do know that disease specific modifications are really important in chronic illness for a variety of reasons. So the adaptations are really throughout the manual. Um, When uh, CBT is introduced, we talk about the relationships of physical to mental health, which would not be something that would typically be emphasized so much um, in a general kind of CBT, but was something that uh, clinically we felt was important and and that people with CF said was was really important that they see that bi-directional impact when they're not feeling so well uh, physically, then their emotions are impacted, their behaviors are impacted. Um, and vice versa. When we talked about relaxation skills, we had to understand that not everyone's going to want to do breathing related exercises. So we had alternatives to that to offer people and choice um, in terms of what kind of relaxation strategies were most effective for them. Um, And, you know, when we thought about adaptive thinking skills, also here's a, here's a place where um, sometimes even a CBT therapist who may not have experience with chronic illness might not, um, might not necessarily approach things the way we would hope, right? So that there may be a realistic thing to be sad or anxious about, and there often is in living with CF. Um, And there are still more and less adaptive ways of managing those thoughts about these realistic concerns um, so that we had to adapt um, the strategies that people might use for um, for counteracting you know, anxious or or uh, negative or dis- or even distorted cognitions to make, come up with a more complex way um, of viewing what's happening with them and what they might be able to do with it. Um, and then uh, in the the session on problem solving, um, specifically there were goals related to health that could be considered broadly in terms of uh, emotional health, but also in terms of physical health. So those are some of the the, the ways that we um, adapted, but But really importantly, um, people who completed the qualitative interview process um, with us gave us permission to use some of their direct quotes throughout the manual. And that's something that um, in the feedback that we've gotten from participants has been really valuable. Hey, I'm not alone. I had this experience too. Here's what someone is saying. So I think that's really, um, that's really in a sense, putting your money where, uh, you know, put it, put it. (laughs) <laughs> is uh, is giving people the sense that um, this is this is something that might help me as well. Yeah, it's a it's a really nice, um, just so specific way to be validating and to offer some normalization. And uh, how nice to be able to integrate actual you know real people with CF's um, input on that. So, can you talk a little bit more about both sort of the assessment process and also the enrollment process? And specifically for assessment, I'm wondering if you found that um, the PHQ and the GAD were comprehensive assessment tools uh, in in cases, or if you would recommend alternative tools or additional tools to um, get a broader sense of how patients are coping? Well, the entry criteria for the study uh, was based on the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 because those are what are used in clinical screening universally um, in CF. And so we we screened people in using the mild range. What we did find is that sometimes, um, although symptoms may have been um, mild with the PHQ-9 or GAD-7, there were more um, what we might consider moderate or even severe um, concerns going on clinically once um, the intervention is started meeting with someone. Mm-hmm. Um, some of that may do it had to have, have to do with a pedonic adaptation, right? People feel like I, I can handle this. It's okay. And then as they start thinking about things more, it's like, well, actually there's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on here. Um, there are certainly other resilience scales and we've seen uh, in the mental health research prioritization workshop process that's been ongoing with the CF foundation that the community did um, 
prioritizes depression and anxiety, anxiety very highly, and that there are also other concerns that are not captured by the PHQ-9 and GAD-7. So um, we are also working on development of um, broader measures. That's something that, that I think will be really important. One of the things that we did in the course of this study was to develop a CF coping self-efficacy scale that's CF specific and may get at some of these, um, some of these other concerns uh, and we were able to validate that in the course of um, in the course of the study, and we'll be presenting that data at another time. Well, and I know for myself, I really look forward to that. As much as I appreciate integrating PHQ and GAD into my practice, um, I think a common topic of discussion amongst my patients is the somatic symptoms, especially in the PHQ, and the degree to which that's CF and and mood is hard to parse out with just that tool. So it's nice to have some more CF specific um, options in in the works. Well, I I think that's actually a really interesting point because um, I think people with CF usually have a good sense of this is how my appetite usually is when I'm sick and this is something different, right? Or this is what happens with my sleep when I'm coughing a lot and this is something different. So I, I actually think the somatic symptoms are really important, but you're right. That's why we don't just go by a score. We have to talk to someone and figure out um, what's going on. But in the um, inflammatory bowel disease um, uh, literature, for example, there's a really interesting study of um, CBT for depression in children with inflammatory bowel disease and that the somatic symptoms actually improve with CBT. Um, So we are, you know, there is some evidence to say, yes, you can still have somatic symptoms of depression or anxiety, even though you have physical symptoms of uh, a chronic condition at the same time. Yeah, nice. Very, very nice clarification. Thanks. Can you discuss your dis- decision to include only those with mild symptoms uh, in the study? Yeah, so this study was conceptualized as a prevention study. Um, so we thought this is, um, you know, th- this is really important given the association of depression with mortality that we um, we see um, that it, uh, sustaining daily care can be difficult for people with uh, mental health conditions. We wanted to see what we could do. Uh, could we prevent um, you know, these symptoms from escalating? Um, and in particular, because as, um, you know, as I said, the guidelines um, don't say as much about what, is the, what do these supportive or preventive interventions look like in the mild range? So right. it, we felt like this was a gap. That said, Um, These are skills that can be useful um, probably for anyone, even if you had minimal symptoms, right? These are the kinds of things we kind of wish they taught taught us at school growing up. And there's certainly um, skills that can be used in people with more severe symptoms. So for example, in our e-health adaptation, um, we adapted this into a a series of modules that are um, self-completed, but with therapist um, intervention and and guidance at various um, steps throughout the way. For that study, uh, the pilot in the Netherlands, we are including people with moderate symptoms there. And for our adolescent adaptation, um, we're we're including people with moderate symptoms as well, because one of the differences here is in the model, um, the CFCBT model for adults, we trained um, interventionists who may may or may not have had a mental health background. So we actually had a pulmonologist, a uh, nurse, right, who, who participated. And so we also thought that would be probably conservative to start with people in the mild range. For the adolescent uh, trial, we have all mental health trained professionals. Uh, we, we are doing it slightly differently to exactly address this kind of question. Could this be used uh, in people th- uh, further throughout the spectrum of depression and anxiety? Nice. And just last quick question, are you enrolling centers in the adolescent study at this time? Um, Not yet, um, but uh, stay tuned. You know, we hope that we hope that we will be able to uh, to do a larger trial um, of the adolescent manual. We're we're piloting it now. Um, We'll make any adjustments that we need to, and then we will go from there. Great, more to come. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Georgiopoulos, for your uh, work and your presentation, and um, and for being a part of this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yes, for sure. Uh, I am now going to introduce. Courtney Lynn, who is a pediatric psychologist at Children's Hospital in Colorado, and she's going to present findings from expanding the CF Foundation's mental health screening guidelines, early childhood behavioral health assessment for children with CF ages 4 to 11. 
Hi, my name is Courtney Lynn, and today I'm going to be giving a presentation on expanding the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Mental Health Screening Guidelines, Early Childhood Behavioral Health Assessment for Children with Cystic Fibrosis. So today I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Dr. Emily Muther. We're both psychologists at Children's Hospital Colorado. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So for the agenda today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about background with mental health screening and cystic fibrosis, how we implemented our universal screening, some results, and then we'll close it off with some conclusions. So for background, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation International Mental Health Guidelines recommend annual mental health screening for depression and anxiety for patients 12 years and older with CF, as well as caregivers. And we know that adolescents and adults with CF and caregivers are at increased risk for both depression and anxiety. However, we're not sure when this risk begins, and there currently aren't any guidelines for mental health screening in toddler and school-aged children. And we know that prevention is key. There's lots of studies on prevention and early intervention showing to really reduce mental health concerns, including depression, anxiety, and those behavior difficulties. So at Children's Hospital Colorado, we really wanted to implement a universal mental health screening for our school age population. We chose to use the pediatric symptom checklist, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. So we wanted to find a measure that we could use for school age children. We wanted it to address a, a variety of internalizing and externalizing concerns. We wanted it to be short and easy to administer and sensitive to difficulties. So with all of this in mind, we decided to implement the pediatric symptom checklist 17 item measure as a universal screening for school aged children. So this measure has three subscales and you get one total score as well. On the internalizing subscale, there's five items. Scores range from zero to 10, and items are scored never, sometimes, or often. And scores greater than or equal to five are indicative of an increased risk for an internalizing disorder, including depression and anxiety. On the externalizing subscale, there's seven items. Scores range from zero to 14, and scores greater than or equal to seven are indicative of increased risk for an externalizing disorder. On the attention subscale, there's five items ranging from zero to 10 and scores greater than seven or equal to seven are indicative of increased risk. And then for the total score, again, 17 items and overall scores of greater than or equal to 15 are indicative of increased risk for a behavioral health difficulty. So some sample items on the internalizing subscale include feels sad, feels hopeless, or worries a lot. This both gets at depression and anxiety. For the attention subscale, fidgety, unable to sit still and has trouble concentrating. Again, the hyperactivity piece as well as the inattentive piece. And then for externalizing, fights with other children, does not listen to rules and teases others, which really capture more conduct or oppositional behaviors. So for the administration at Children's Hospital Colorado, we assign our universal screenings to patients through the electronic medical record, and we use EPIC. So parents are able to complete the measure before their clinic visit if we're on top of it and assign it to them in time. If not, they complete it at the beginning of their clinic visit. Scores are reviewed for areas where there's elevation, and then the psychologist reviews the scores with the family and we conduct a health and behavior assessment or intervention depending on what is needed. And then for follow-up, we planned to rescreen patient to rescreen patients one year later. So for the first time point, we had a hundred parents who were administered the pediatric symptom checklist. Um, the mean age was 7.85 years and ranged from four to 11 years. 47% were female, and we had good reliability for the total scale as well as individual subscales. We rescreened 26 patients, so that would be time two. Um, and we rescreened them for a variety of reasons. We're still kind of clarifying what is going to work best in our clinic. 
So 61.5% were rescreened less than a year later. So 19% were rescreened due to being elevated the first time. And then other reasons for rescreening were that a different parent was, was available for this clinic visit. So we wanted to get a different perspective, or maybe there was difficulty with keeping appointments. So we wanted to make sure that we captured them. And so we might have rescreened a little bit early. And then 38.5% were rescreened again at that one year time mark. So looking at time one results, so 100 parents completed the screener. On the internalizing subscale, there was a mean score of 1.5 and 5% of patients screened at risk for an internalizing disorder. On the externalizing subscale, 3% of patients screened at risk for an externalizing disorder and 8% of patients screened at risk for attention. 5% screened at risk on total score. And what's really important to note is that 12% of patients screened at risk on at least one subscale. So this is really greater than the general population. So 12% were showing some concern on at least one subscale. Time two with 26 patients on the internalizing subscale, 27% screened at risk. Um, so we had a smaller amount of patients being screened. However, there were um, high rates of being at risk, 8% at risk for externalizing, and then 19% screened at risk for attention. And then the total subscale 27 were at risk on the total score, and 19% were at risk on at least one subscale. And again, this marker was really what we were looking at. So 19% um, screened at risk for at least one subscale. So some follow-up. So like I mentioned, 12% were elevated at time one. 40, nearly 42% of those patients were seen by psychology for an outpatient therapy visit. So we were able to follow up with them outside of CF clinic. 16 or almost 17% of participants um, already had a community therapist that they were being followed by. 17% were given referrals for community providers. So we were mostly doing telehealth. And so sometimes patients wanted to be seen in person, or even if we were able to see them in person, person some of our patients live really far away from the hospital and they wanted to see someone closer to where they live. And then 25% of patients continued to be followed during CF clinic, and we were providing that health and behavior intervention during their clinic visits. So some overall conclusions, 12% of patients were elevated for at least one concern during that time one. Again, this is higher than what we expect in the general population and really supports the need for universal screening for school age children. Treating patients for internalizing, externalizing, and attention difficulties earlier may reduce the incidence of mental health symptoms in adolescents. And so we're interested in continuing to collect these data and conducting longitudinal studies um, later on to support whether or not early intervention and screening really prevents some of those mental health difficulties that we see later on in adolescents. And then this is the first step in conducting school age screening for kids with cystic fibrosis or for school age children with cystic fibrosis. So we really need further evaluation to determine what the best measure is. There's a lot of measures like the SCARE that looks at just anxiety symptoms or measures that look at just depression symptoms. So really deciding what the most appropriate screeners are is going to be really important. And then also looking at parent report versus patient report. So the pediatric symptom checklist is a parent report measure, but we might get better data using patient report or having a measure that does both parent and patient report. So this was the first step for us in really implementing this universal screening and seeing how it works in our clinic. Um, and there are lots of future steps for us to take to really determine what the best model is going to be and what the best way um, this is, how this is going to look for our clinic. And I am looking forward to answering questions during the Q&A. Dr. Lynn, thank you so much for this work. And I love all of the potential clinical applica applications. Uh, and I'm really curious to hear more of your thoughts. Um, we've got um, a fair number of questions about kind of 
extrapolating from the data. And, and maybe the first one to ask is, how do you think the pandemic affected young children with CF? And do you think it might have impacted the rates of elevations found? Or do you think this is a, a good baseline to consider? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think there were lots of changes that younger kids um, with CF and younger kids in the general population um, experienced during COVID, not going to school, not being able to be involved in a lot of extracurricular activities, disruptions with so social support. Um, so I think that we maybe were expecting to see symptoms that were even more elevated than what we found. Um, so I think that this baseline that we have is kind of in some ways similar to the general population. Um, we found more concerns overall, but when we looked at individual or internalizing, externalizing and attention symptoms um, kind of parsed out, um, they were kind of consistent with what the general population experiences. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the next few years, what the scores look like after COVID, if that ever kind of settles down. Um, and kids are experiencing more normal routines. Oh, come on. It's going to settle down eventually, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> this isn't like new normal forever. Okay. Right. So, well, especially with vaccines coming out with the younger kids that could, you know, also um, have an impact on, on scores as well. Yeah. So there's a, a few different questions about your thoughts on assessment tools and assessment approach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess the, the first one I'd like to check in with you about is, would you want to incorporate self-report for kids in the sort of middle elementary age range, or um, would you continue to, to use the assessment approach that you started with for kids four to 11? Yeah, I think that's something that we've considered a lot now that we have some data and um, some anecdotal data that we have too, after giving some of the screeners and then going in and doing a health and behavior assessment or meeting with the family, there were concerns, but they weren't necessarily marked on um, the screener or they weren't elevated on the screener. So I think getting um, the report of the child will be really important. And so we're looking into ways of incorporating that into some of our screening that we're doing, or maybe even looking at additional screeners. Um, I think there were some other questions about just the um, pediatric symptom checklist in general. And one thing that we have talked about is that, you know, it doesn't go into a lot of depth on anxiety or depression. It's more kind of these general questions and there's, you know, a few of, of them. Um, so maybe even giving more screeners or different screeners that have more in-depth questions on anxiety or depression, ADHD symptoms, it might take a little bit longer, um, but we might be able to have, you know, some more better screening data or be able to capture some of those um, elevations. And this is related, but just, I think a quick clarification, someone wanted to know, did you do this just until age 11 and then move to the, um, yes. Okay. Move to yep. the GAD seven and PHQ at, at age 12. Okay. Yep. Um, so then there's a few questions, uh, looking at the, um, interpretation of the findings. And then there's also a couple questions about workflow. I'm hoping we're going to have time for both. So, um, someone asks, did you look at the characteristics of the kids who were screen positive? Were they more likely to have experienced more invasive procedures or testing more medical stress or trauma? That's a really good question. We did not look at, at those, um, characteristics specifically. Anecdotally, the patients that we ended up following for outpatient therapy that were elevated had more psychosocial concerns going on. I think being at home during the pandemic, especially, and not being able to be at school was challenging for um, several family systems. And so, you know, getting families to implement some behavioral interventions um, or to do some more coping strategies or increasing social support was really beneficial. So, I think several kind of, you know, there were other characteristics. We did not look at those specifically, but anecdotally, I think there were additional stressors that some of the um, kids who screened positive were experiencing. Got it. Uh, someone asks how the parents responded when they found out that their child was at higher risk or were recommended to have psychological intervention. I think a lot of them maybe were not surprised. Um, okay. It is parent, you know, the measures parent report. Um, so I think, you know, they were reporting what they've experienced and there is um, a question on there, like, does your child have difficulties essentially? And they could mark yes or no. 
Um, so I think some parents kind of knew things were going on. They maybe didn't know how to intervene or what support would look like. Um, but most families were very open. You know, they're used to meeting with us on a yearly basis. So at least yearly basis, a lot of families we see, you know, almost every visit that they come in. And so they are familiar with us, familiar, you know, with things that we talk about. And so a lot of times, um, you know, it wasn't completely surprising. Got it. So how did adding the screening affect the flow of clinic or the flow of your work process? Yeah. So this is something that we have been working on, even with the adolescent screening and the caregiver screening of how to incorporate these things into our workflow to make it, you know, not super time consuming and kind of make um, the process easy. And so we administer our screeners through the electronic medical record. So what that looks like is we assign the questionnaires before their visit. And so some families are, you know, look on my chart before they come in. And so some families actually answered the questionnaires maybe the night before. Um, But when they're in clinic, patients get or families get an iPad and on there are questionnaires for the review of systems, history. Um, So they get other questionnaires assigned to them from different providers, food insecurity um, screening. And so our, the pediatric symptom checklist, our adolescent mental health screening is also kind of part of that process. Um, So they're already getting these iPads with a bunch of questionnaires. And so ours were kind of added into it. And then we're able to look in my chart or not in my chart, but look in Epic and see the results of the screener before we go into the room. So we kind of know um, some of the concerns that they are, you know, or some of the concerns that they're reporting. And we're able to, you know, talk to them about specific items or if things are going well, we can, you know, have a really um, strength focused appointment. Nice. Were the patients ever asked about the internalizing symptoms? I mean, in order to account for patients that may not be communicating those feelings to their patient, to their parents. Yeah. I think one of the overall things that is kind of making us think about the screening a little bit more in ways that we can improve it is that, yeah, just like that question, oftentimes parents reported no concerns when we go into the room to meet with families as we, you know, would anyways, concerns kind of come up, you know, either the child is stating concerns or one thing that we've, you know, really found is even the questions, they might say there's no problems, but then you go in the room and, you know, maybe the child doesn't like doing vest treatments. And so they feel really sad about having CF or they don't want to sit still during best treatments, or, you know, they're having troubles eating at the dinner table. And so some of those kind of CF specific concerns that we see aren't captured in those questions, like the externalizing questions talk about teasing others or taking things that don't belong to them. Um, But running away from best treatments is not necessarily on there. So I think, you know, it was really important. The screening is absolutely a first step and we're really excited Um, to have these data and to start this process. And I think when we go in the room and we have those conversations with families and talk to the kids and get the kids perspective, oftentimes, you know, we were able to find some concerns that didn't come up on the screening. So that part of meeting with the families was also really important. Nice. So you're able to use having done the screening as a conversation opener that then allowed you, of course, to do more nuanced clinical assessment. That's really nice. So are you starting to consider the use of additional or alternative screenings to the PSC? I mean, I know there's pros and cons, and you mentioned that briefly in your in your talk. Are you considering the use of other pediatric psychosocial measures? Yeah, we're still, you know, we're still kind of looking at the data that we have. We've since uh, this presentation have several other, you know, patients that we've now given the PSC to. So we have more data and more time to data. So we're kind of still in the process of looking at that. But I think we have as a team been considering um, what, you know, measures we can give that might capture more of the CF difficulties that we're seeing or more of those um, problems specifically related to CF. And then maybe even, you know, adding the child report. And so maybe looking at the scared or some other depression measures that go into more detail um, about symptoms of depression could also be helpful. So we're still kind of looking at what we've done so far with the idea that we might shift a little bit in the future and maybe add some different things or change um, some things that we've been doing. 
Really nice. And I should note that in the um, chat box, there's a, there are a number of comments expressing enthusiasm for the work and really excited about the work that you're doing. So thank you so much, Courtney. <laughs> yeah. I think we're out of time. So I'm going to introduce the next Thanks. abstract. And I want to thank you again so much for the work and for sharing your insights with us today. So... So next up is Kimberly Cantor, uh, and her um, abstract is sleep-related outcomes following participation in a behavioral sleep intervention for youth with cystic fibrosis. And Kim Cantor is a research scientist at Nemours, and I correct me how I said it, Children's Health in Delaware, and a pediatric psychologist with the CF team. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Cantor. I'm a pediatric psychologist and research scientist at New Morris Children's Health Delaware. I'm very excited to be talking with you today about the following study titled Sleep-Related Outcomes Following Participation in a Behavioral Sleep Intervention for Youth with CF. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. We are fortunate um, to have this work supported by a clinical pilot and feasibility award from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. To start out, I just want to orient you to our team. Um, I'm really privileged to be presenting today, but this is very much a group project. Um, my colleagues, Dr. Abigail Strang and Dr. Aaron Chittikel, um, our pulmonologist, Dr. Chittikel is our CF Center Director. They're co-investigators on the project. Catherine Okanak is our research coordinator on the study. Um, and Sophie Wilkes is a former undergraduate research scholar who was critical to this work and is now um, getting her nursing degree at Emory. So to start out, I wanna walk through the aims of this study. Um, as an overview, this is actually a mixed method study. So the qualitative arm, was part one, and we were really focused on understanding sleep concerns and intervention needs. We're really pleased to have published a manuscript describing these results that came out last year um, in clinical psychology and medical settings. And what I'll be talking about today is um, the quantitative arm of this work, where we focused on developing and evaluating sleep CF. Specifically, I'll be walking through the primary outcomes, which were acceptability and feasibility, and then also briefly talking about technology use, sleep health and hygiene, and sleep knowledge. So as some background, why did we undertake this work in the first place? So there's not actually a whole lot of literature on pediatric sleep and CF, but we do know that youth with CF are at heightened risk for sleep problems. Um, there are likely physical and psychological symptoms that contribute to this, so things like um, coughing or issues with the lungs that lead to um, disrupted sleep. And then psychological symptoms. We know things like anxiety and depression can lead to increased sleep problems. And these are elevated for, for people with CF, as we all know. Um, interestingly, this came up in part one, the qualitative part of our study. But we heard from families that sleep concerns might not come up as part of routine CF clinic care. Um, people may see these concerns as separate from, from their cystic fibrosis. So um, this, this, there might be more of a need for something like this than we were previously aware of. This is just um, an overview of how our intervention works. So we had data collection at three time points, baseline, um, a second, a halfway assessment point, and then a final assessment. We had two what we call core intervention programs um, pre-pandemic. These were delivered in person. Um, Post-pandemic, our study kind of bridged the pandemic. We, we did offer in person, but virtual as well. And then four remote booster sessions where we um, reviewed intervention content focused specifically on concerns that the participant had. These are some of the measures we used. So we had a satisfaction survey, which was primary. Um, investigator created knowledge and technology use surveys. Then we used the, um, the validated children's reported sleep patterns, as well as validated parent proxy promised sleep disturbance and impairment measures. So our participants in this study, um, we had 15 participants, or I'm sorry, 16 particip participants who consented um, and completed baseline measures, 16 kids, 16 parents, um, filling out parent proxy measures. 
We had two participants who um, dropped out after completing baseline measures, but never, um, never actually started the intervention. And then we had two who dropped out over the course of the study, one um, before time three measures, one before time two. So overall, 75% retention, which we were, we were pretty pleased with. Um, like I said, our primary results were acceptability and feasibility. We're looking at the parent proxy data now. Um, and for, for our purposes, purple and, and this blue color here, mostly true and very true, are kind of our, our best, best responses, so to speak. And you can see overwhelmingly, parents were, were pretty pleased with the intervention. Um, it found it flexible, helpful, um, enjoyed the telehealth booster sessions, found the topics relevant, trusted the information. Um, and for the youth, for the kids and teens themselves, we saw um, similar to slightly more positive results. And as a reminder, the kids, the youth were participants in the intervention. The parents um, didn't actually have a role in the intervention. So we're seeing for the participants themselves, um, they also found it helpful, were satisfied with the intervention overall, trusted the intervention, found it easy to understand. So our, our results in terms of acceptability and feasibility are strong. When we look at um, some of the sleep-related outcomes, we collected data in a few different ways. And it is important to note here again that technology use was likely very impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic as all aspects of our life were. So, so some of these results um, may have been impacted by the pandemic for people who were actively participating when school went virtual or who enrolled after that occurred. Um, on our own technology use survey, we saw some decreases. Um, so youth reporting um, less electronic use within an hour of bedtime, less electronic use, use after the lights are turned off. Um, on the children's report of sleep patterns, which, which asked slightly different questions, we saw um, slight increases in the electronics use index and activities before bed. Um, and, and similar for parents, um, a slight increase in electronics use, but a decrease for activities before bed. Um, when we're looking at other areas of sleep habits and hygiene, we saw um, mixed, mixed results for our youth and their parents. So on the children's report of sleep patterns, youth reporting from time one to time three decreases on, um, on indexes looking at sleep location, bedtime fears and worries and sleepiness, um, no changes or slight increases on caffeine use and insomnia, parents reporting decrease on the sleep location index and slight increases uh, or no change on caffeine, electronics use, bedtime fears and worries and sleepiness. On all of these subscales, higher scores indicate worse functioning. Um, on the parent proxy reports for the promised sleep disturbance um, and sleep impairment measures, we saw moderate to large effect sizes, which, which is a good, good thing to see. We saw slight improvements on sleep knowledge scores. So we focused on module one on sleep knowledge, teaching kind of good information about sleep. And we saw, saw some improvement there. Um, so overall conclusions. Um, it's important to note that most of our participants were not reporting clinically significant sleep concerns. Um, however, our acceptability and feasibility were quite high, showing that um, there might be some benefit to providing this intervention, even in a, a normal um, sleep population. We also saw on the promise, um, promise parent proxy reports on some of our investigator design surveys and on some indexes of the CRSP, some improvements in certain areas. So there may be benefit here. Um, similarly, benefit of providing information about normative sleep um, based on that knowledge assessment and based on some qualitative comments we got on our acceptability and feasibility um, form, there might be some benefit to providing just education about sleep as part of routine CF care. Nighttime technology use is highly prevalent, um, not surprising, but obviously has implications for sleep. We also, um, just based on the timeline and our data, 
Um, it's very possible that changes to the sleep wake patterns, especially for our teenagers, and increased technology use may have been attributable to the pandemic and might have impacted our results. And what we really like to do with this is um, collect feedback from the broader CF community regarding the need for this intervention and also the utility of it. Um, we have some questions, for example, about if some of the health impacts that we're seeing with tri trichapta, highly effective modulator therapy, if that might have an impact on sleep, if there might be more benefit for people who have clinically significant sleep concerns. So lots of exciting directions to take this. Um, thank you so much for your time. Here's where you can find me by email, on Twitter. We do have a poster going into these results as well, and I look forward to taking some questions and talking more with all of you. Thank you. Kim, that abstract was fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing it, and welcome to NACFC. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of questions, and you know, I think I think the thing that excited me about this work is thinking about how applicable it is, and also the po the really positive response it seems like that seems that you got for it. Um, are there any lessons learned from administering this intervention during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we we had um, kind of a range of experiences in terms of timing. So we had a, a few people who went through the intervention all pre-COVID, but we had a number of participants who kind of crossed over. So they might have started before things shut down and then continued after. And then we had some participants who were fully um, post the start of, of the pandemic and all the associated disruptions. Um, one really nice thing was we, we had designed the intervention from the onset to be as flexible as possible for our CF community. So telehealth was already actually integrated into our protocol, which made it much easier. Um, but I think we, you know, thinking about sleep and screens and everything that happened with technology use, um, especially with our older elementary students and teenagers who, who were the, the bulk of the participants. Um, I think the disruptions to their sleep that were in response to COVID and to some extent kind of necessary, like we, we talked a lot about screens, but if you're a high schooler and all your homework is now online and you have to be up doing it, it, it presented some challenges, but also I think some good opportunities for us to, um, kind of react to issues that were happening in, in real time in a, a way that I think was, was useful to a number of our participants. Um, from a study management and logistics perspective, I think it was, we were worried, like I'm sure all of us were in all different sorts of ways about the impact COVID would have on our study. But I think procedurally, um, it actually was a pretty smooth transition with online data collection, telehealth, um, and people were getting more and more used to telehealth for medical appointments and for school. So um, for this particular study, I guess it, it wasn't as disruptive in terms of delivering the intervention as, as it could have been. Okay. Well, and I mean, it's, in that way, it sounds like the study was just by kismet or luck or whatever, <laughs> sort of designed to be <laughs> adaptable for a setting where suddenly people are, are building additional skills and using the tech and could mobilize maybe more easily for that. I don't know whether you found that that uh, te the teens in particular were sick of screen time and might have had some resistance to the intervention related to that. Yeah, that that's interesting. <laughs> um, I think, and in my clinical work, I feel like I, I heard this more that people were just having fatigue with screens. Um, yeah. For the, the sleep CF intervention, um, we didn't hear that specifically. And I, I think part of that might've been because when people consented, they, they knew it was gonna be um, time limited. They knew it was gonna be virtual and our, our sessions were pretty brief. So that was also by design. Um, I do think though we heard, especially from some of our teens who didn't really have, they wanted to participate, they thought it was cool, um, but they didn't really have clinical sleep issues. Um, our our follow-up sessions were definitely very brief and, and perhaps that was impacted in part by just being sick of being on the screen. So 
people who didn't have major concerns were kind of like, oh, yeah, it's nice to see you. Let's talk about my nighttime routine. But it was maybe a 10 minute session versus versus a 20 or 25 minute one. Got it. Got it. So is that related then? So and how is that? How does that look in terms of your data? Do you think the different the, that stratification? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So the um, the booster sessions, which are the parts that were primarily delivered online, um, we weren't we weren't collecting specific data about those sessions. We were really looking at the um, the outcomes, sleep behaviors. Um, so it's it's hard to say from this this pilot study, I think, how much the something like the session length might have been impacted. I do think the flexibility and the willingness to accommodate what the participant needed was a big takeaway for us that if something like this is going to be successful, we don't want to force someone to do a whole bunch of things that they're telling us they don't really need. So that that was a good lesson, I think, for our group. Yeah, that's great in terms of offering patient-centered care. And that may be then tied into this next question, which is how this sleep intervention is different than a general sleep intervention. Is that one example, or do you have others of the ways that this was tailored specifically for kids and teens? Yeah, that's a, a great question and one that came up in our, our grant review too. So yeah. um, something we've, we've had the chance to think about. Um, I think there were there were a couple ways that we modified specifically for the CF population. And I, um, I do a lot of qualitative research. So the mixed method design, um, I think was really helpful because we heard from parents and from, um, kids and teens with CF, what they thought they needed. And we were able to tailor the intervention in that way. So, so I do think the flexibility, um, was important you know, this was, we designed this study and started also in the the pre-Trikafta times. So um, we were hearing a lot, things like, you know, especially when my child's sick, they're already doing maybe four airway clearance a day. They don't want something that takes a lot of time. And we heard that from patients too, that um, I already spend so much time doing treatments every day. I don't really want to do one more thing. So we tried to think about that with the flexibility and the timing. Um, We also did tailor our educational content to include what we knew about CF um, and how it might impact sleep. And we we did include some focus on um, physical symptoms as well as the, the what we know about anxiety and depression and how those things can impact sleep in CF. So we tried to make it as specific as possible. Um, And I think scheduling was so in our, um, we give participants some choice about the specific skills that they want to focus on and um, scheduling came up a lot. And I do think the the CF tailoring is really important there because it's not just your normal school and homework and sports. It's also treatments and and all the other things that you have to add in with CF. So those, those are some examples of the tailoring. Got it. So you really did some really nice tailoring in terms of chronic disease effect on sleep and then CF effects on sleep. Did you do age tailoring as well or was it standardized? Yeah. So the way um, maybe I, I should have talked about the specific components of the intervention a little bit more, but we had basically two core modules and then these four booster sessions. So our first core um, with sleep education. And we, we highlighted the same facts for all participants, but we definitely tailored the, the delivery and what we highlighted based on the age group. Um, our second core session, we, we kind of offered a, a menu of evidence-based sleep skills. So would you like to um, focus on, on relaxation, on ways we think about sleep, on scheduling, and that that we tailored a lot to the specific child, um, including their age, but also other child specific factors that, that were relevant. Got it. A question from the audience is related to how much specificity you talked about in terms of electronics use. And so the example is it's possible to get absorbed in social media Mm -hmm. with scrolling without realizing how much time has passed. Is that the sort of things you got specific about with, with participants? Yeah, we, we, um, assess for technology use, um, I guess formally in our, our study measures, but it also came up 
all the time in those, those booster follow-up sessions. Um, we would, I think, try and pose it a little more open-ended to find out what, if anything, the participant themselves was concerned about or struggling with related to sleep. But I do think that social media piece came up a lot. So we did a lot of um, problem solving around how, you know, where can we put your phone? Maybe that's not right next to your bed. So it's, so you're not as tempted or it's not waking you up with alerts or um, let's think about a good time to shut off the social media and transition to something else. Um, You know, anecdotally, I think our teenagers are maybe a little more willing to have those conversations with us than they might be with mom or dad saying time to get off the phone. Um, And I, I do think, you know, that was one big impact of the pandemic. It was kind of a, a mixed bag of, I'm so sick of being on the screen, but also it's the main way I'm connecting with my friends. So navigating that and helping families navigate that was definitely something we discussed a lot. Yeah. And it, this, that's a nice tie in to maybe our last question uh, for our time is the degree to which parents were involved in the intervention. I know that in your slides, you talked about this really being patient self self report, but I wonder how parents were involved. Yeah, that that's a good question. And our, so our youngest participants who were eligible were, were 10. So for the, and we, we had a couple of kids on the younger end, but it, it did end up being more, I would say 16, 17 or 15 up maybe. So for those younger kids, um, the parents were usually present during the, during the intervention sessions and they, they were more involved in bedtime. They, they weighed in more, but we were um, targeting really the, the skills towards the, the child participant. Most of our teenagers participated independently. Um, I do think, you know, as we're thinking about next directions, there, there may be as a role for um, at least a parent education piece. I think some of our parents were definitely interested in that, but in, in this trial, it was, it was primarily focused on the, the child participant. Got it. And, and what a lovely trial it was. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for uh, the opportunity. Yeah, of course. So I think we're about to close the session. If speakers are, if um, presenters and Dr. Friedman are still there, maybe you can turn on your cameras just to say goodbye. And we wanna thank the CFF so much and NACFC for doing a fantastic job with this meeting. We look forward to seeing everybody in person as soon as possible. And in the meantime, um, thanks so much. Any last thoughts from our speakers before we close? Okay. Happy Friday, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you, everybody.